The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Welcome back to the KME Studios. My name is Hector Nino and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today we have a great show planned for you. Uh, our first guest will be a revisit to my interview with Dr. Diane Cahill Bedford. She is a clinical associate professor and section chair of dance science and performing arts in the School of Performing Visual and Fine Arts. Uh, we talk a little bit about her love for dance and where that started, why she dances, and why her teaching pedagogy is so important to her. If you'd like to learn more about uh, Dr. Bedford or you'd like to check out her work, you can go to her website at dianekhillbedford.com. All right, and for my second interview, we will be revisiting my interview with Luke Knowles, who is a hair artist or hairstylist and multimedia artist and abstract painter. He does it all. <laughs> and um, we talk a little bit about his brand and how he plans on um, using this brand to improve men's mental health and overall wellness. Uh, if you'd like to check out more about his brand and um, projects he's working on, you can go to cutsbylukeknowles.com where you can also set up uh, an appointment to get a haircut by Luke. So, <laughs> yes, make sure to go to cutsbylukeknowles.com. All right, and now for our, our announcements, we have Stage Center is uh, is putting on a performance of A Christmas Story, and they have actually started running December 1st, and they will have showings until December 17th, so you have plenty of chances to go see it. Um, and this is a great time for uh, the, full, the whole family to enjoy a, a Christmas story, and if you would like to get some tickets, you can go to stagecenter.net. All right, and for our last art announcement, I did want to remind you guys of the heart of art at tamu.edu is the email that you can email uh, if you have any artists that you'd like to see on the show or any uh, performances that are coming up that you would like to have featured here on the show as well, any local performances that are happening. And that's the heart of art at tamu.edu. All right, now let's start my interview with Dr. Diane Cahill Bedford. And alongside me in the KMU studios is a very special guest. Uh, she was actually one of my professors in back in the spring of 2018. Uh, her name is Diane Cahill Bedford, and she is currently the clinical professor in the dance science program here at Texas A&M and is a very decorated choreographer with uh, showings all over the U.S. If you'd like to check out her work, you can go to her website at dianecahillbedford.com. Hello, Diane. How are you today? I'm great. How are you, Hector? Doing great. I'm excited for a conversation today. I haven't seen you in so long. <laughs> How have you been? Well, you know, like anything, it's always crazy and hectic and at A&M, but good overall. Yes. Um, so I saw you went to Florida State University. Are you originally from Florida? Mostly. My family moved to Florida when I was about 10 years old. Mm. My mom was a nurse and she was transferred to a hospital there. And so I mainly say that I grew up in Florida. I didn't come from a military family, but I did move around a lot. All right. Okay. <laughs> but Florida is definitely the longest place that I live besides Texas. Mm, okay. Um, would you say that your love for dance started in Florida? Oh, no. Actually, I started dancing when I was four years old. Oh, wow. Okay. Very so, young. yeah, it just, it grew, obviously, um, as I got older and became more serious about it but I'd been dancing for a long time and I think it was probably about middle school I decided 
okay, I really want to be more serious about this and take on more lessons and more training. All right. So it was pretty early on because, I mean, your bachelor's was in dance and English literature, correct? Yes. And then a master's in dance performance and choreography. So you really, you knew what you wanted to do and you went for it. Yes. Um, <laughs> what type of research did you do for your master's? Well, the MFA that I completed at Florida State University again, as you said, was an emphasis on performance and choreography. Mm -hmm. One of the areas that I was most interested in exploring was dance and technology. Okay. So it's not necessarily a track that is written on the degree, but there are lots of different tracks that you can pursue, and that was of interest to me. So being able to combine dance with specialized projection design, um, camera work, dancing for the camera, dance film, and just a whole different slew of how we incorporate technology with dance to kind of make these total theater pieces, if you will. Right. So that was a big proponent of my work there and a big area of interest that I like to explore. I feel like I've seen a little bit of that because I do remember seeing your uh, show Aurora Borealis. Yes. And it was lights and props and it was it was awesome. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, I'm, I see that people have been coming to you for your expertise as well. You've done um, international conferences as well as national ones. Mm -hmm. And just to mention a couple, uh, National Dance Educators Organization, you've spoken for them, as well as the International Association for Dance, Medicine, and Science. Yes. I mean, that must be feel awesome to be recognized like that. <laughs> it is. I mean, part of what we do through our position at a and is teaching presentations and research, uh, even though I'm a clinical associate faculty, which is a teaching emphasis, we still have those components of research and service and sharing what we do. And for me, I really love sharing my pedagogical practices and what I do in my different classes. So being able to present at these conferences not only gives me an opportunity to learn and see and talk to other professionals in my field and hopefully glean some information I can bring back into my work, but also to share what I do in the hopes that maybe it would help someone else in their process. Awesome. I love that, that you're, everyone's learning from each other. Yes. At these. Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's move on and segue a little bit more into dance itself. Um, and my first question here is, why do you dance? Oh, gosh. I Well, part of it, as I said, I grew up dancing, mm -hmm. but I think that for me, I don't know any other way that I feel the most expressive of who I am. I really just become absorbed in the music and the feeling and the artistry of movement and what I can convey to the audience, what kinds of thoughts can I stoke in them and just being able to share that, that part of myself just feels like there are no words. And there is a famous quote about that from a choreographer named Doris Humphrey. It says, there's just, sometimes there are no words. And that's why I love dance, is just for that medium of being able to fully express myself and the different sides of my interest and take on characters and just being able to connect with audience members and connect with myself. Awesome. Would you say it's cathartic in a way? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I always feel when I'm done with a dance class, especially now, I don't get to dance for myself much anymore, but it is just this wonderful feeling of complete, I don't know, relaxation in a way, even though I've worked hard, but it's, it's like a little bit of my soul feels at peace. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like also you know, in that self-expression aspect, like the fact that it involves like your full brain and concentration, your full body, you know, and it's everything coordinating together. Um, I feel like that's where you get into that mental space. I mean, I know that you also choreograph and, and dance. Would you say you have a favorite between the two? Well, I think that it's, it's always a difficult transition, I feel like, for dancers to move into other things because at the heart of 
I think what a lot of people do is dance and is perform. And so I love choreography as a means of trying to figure out how to take my ideas and express them through other bodies. And that is just a different kind of artistic and emotional and so for you there's not really a difference between the two I mean I would say that there's a difference but not necessarily that I have a favorite they're both Mm. very rewarding for different reasons okay awesome awesome and um for choreographing um do you have like a specific artistic process how do you how do you start a project that's a really interesting question because I talk about this a lot with choreographers that have a a pretty specific process and I feel like my process is pretty multi-varied in that depending on the work that I want to do because I also will choreograph in both the contemporary ballet genre and then the modern or contemporary dance genre but depending on the piece that I'm doing sometimes I come to the studio with pre-made movement phrases and ideas that I teach the dancers, I set on them, and then I work on organizing and structuring and cutting things up like a patchwork quilt where I'll fuse this part of that together and this uh, phrase with another part or uh, how that then moves people through the space. Sometimes, as the piece that you mentioned before, Aurora Borealis, Uh, That was really a collaborative process with my dancers because they were holding flashlights and it was in the dark. And so we were trying to discover, well, what happens when you're holding it here and illuminating this part of another dancer? Or what happens when you hold it behind the white cyclorama in the back and when you get it closer and further away? And what happens with the play in shadows? So for that process, there was a lot of the dancers creating movement and ideas based off of suggestions or questions or even just uh, a simple prompt of an idea and then me kind of shaping it, right? right? And looking at what I found interesting or what I wanted to maybe try this. So it really is an experimental process when I work collaboratively. Right, you kind of learn as you go. Right? Yeah. Okay, awesome, I love that. Yeah. This was actually, uh, I learned something from your class. Um, the fact that dance has so many like cultural implications as well. I remember we spoke about ballet and how it was very, you know, high reaching towards the sky, you know, getting closer to God. Um, yeah. Do you have any uh, other interesting uh, things like within dance that highlight certain cultures? Sure. I mean, I think one of the main things that I draw attention to is dance that stems from European countries, right? Mm -hmm. So ballet in of itself is a concert dance form, but it came out of court dances from France. So in a lot of ways, it is its own cultural dance because it has a niche, which is European society. And many of the dances that stem from that region, the British Isles, Scotland, or uh, Ireland, Scotland, that they'll have similar qualities of that upright verticality being on the balls of the feet, you know, looking at cathedrals and paintings, draw your eyes upward, that it also has, as you said, kind of relationship to religion and, you know, where we feel God presides in Christianity or Catholicism or Catholicism. And then you look at dances that stem from, uh, the African and Latin diaspora. And those dances tend to be more grounded, more bent knees, more uh, power driven, more earthbound, lots of bending of the spine and lots of improvisation. And that also is reflective of belief systems that are different where the gods reside on earth or in the body. They, you know, can take over the body. And so Mm. what I really like to emphasize in the class, and those are just two examples, is that tradition means something different depending on where you are in the world. And just because this tradition over here in this country 
is drastically different from this tradition that we shouldn't be placing value judgments on which is better, mm -hmm. but rather trying to understand, well, why, why are those characteristics important? Why are they present? How does it reflect society, religion, community, culture, beliefs? So being able to then understand those cultures helps us understand what dance looks like and I think ultimately helps us understand one another better. Right. Wow, thank you for that insight. I feel like after I took that class, I started seeing dance in a completely different light. So, and Yay. I think our audience will too. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I know that your focus here at A&M is, you know, the teaching aspect of it. And um, I would say, how do, you, how do you train someone who might be like a natural born dancer versus someone who might not have that much rhythm or, you know, has doubts going into it? Sure. I would say that I really try to look at every student as an individual. And despite the fact that they may be given the same material, the way that I might approach one student in terms of giving them corrections or feedback or mentoring would be a little different than someone else who maybe doesn't want to perform. Maybe they want to pursue teaching. So one of the things that I like to do with my students, especially in my dance technique classes in the beginning is to have them fill out a survey. How do you like to receive information? What kind of corrections work best with you? Do you like hands-on touch corrections? Do you like general corrections that are said to everyone so you're not singled out? Do you like me to come and speak to you closely rather than calling your name across the room if I happen to see something that I want to tell you in that moment? And so I really try to, as best I can, mm -hmm. individualize instruction in that way so that every student feels seen, every student feels that whatever their end goal is matters and that we need to move away from this idea that dance is one size fits all. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, I love that the education education process is you're actually incorporating the people that are learning it and mm -hmm. they're a part of that process as well. I love that. Well, um, thank you so much for coming in, Professor Bedford. <laughs> thank you so much for coming in. Uh, I learned so much, and I, I bet the audience did too. Well, I really appreciate you having me, and it's really fun to share this, and hopefully it just gives people a little new light. So thank you for having me. All right, you guys, we will be going on a quick break, but do not go anywhere. We will be right back. Support for KAMU comes from the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. And welcome back to the studios. Now we will be revisiting my interview with Luke Knowles, who is a hairstylist and multimedia artist. And this interview took place August 15th of this year. Today in the KMU studios, we have a special guest. His name is Luke Knowles. Uh, he is a hairstylist and barber, but is also a painter and co-owner of CrossFit Obey. Uh, he's also building a brand that involves, quote, hair, fashion, men's mental and physical health. So hi, Luke. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really uh, interested by this brand that you're building. Um, before we go into your art, I do like to go through the background of my guests first and figure out where that love for art started. So I did want to ask you, where were you raised and what environment fostered this creativity that you have? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm from Magnolia, Texas. Right. Shout out to the homies. Mm -hmm. My mom has been a mixed media artist uh, since years before I was born. Uh, their dream house that they built about 16 years ago in Magnolia and River Park Ranch um, has about a 400 square foot art studio in it Wow! where my mom spun pottery and she even had a kiln in there for a little while. Um, she's done woodworking, she's done calligraphy, watercolor, acrylic, oil, uh, I mean mixed media to true to form where she would do pieces that are, you know, incorporating 15 20 different materials and hundreds of techniques you know so she's done 
everything. And so I was in that kind of environment for a long time. And to make a long story short, uh, my mom definitely inspired my creativity. Right. And in high school, I was in art classes and it was so rigorous and going over the color wheel was beyond boring whenever I was watching my mom throw you know pottery on a canvas and do all this mixed media cool stuff at home and so I quit art and oh, that's yeah. when I started cutting hair and really? that's where my kind of artistic you know that's where my artistry kind of found its home huh, so for because a while. of hairstyling you kind of went back to your creativity yeah. side awesome that's interesting and so did you not really see yourself as a hairstylist growing up? Like, did you ever see that as a possibility for yourself? No, not at all. I was cutting hair for my little brother. He came home from sports clips, had a bad haircut, and I just gave him a buzz cut, basically. Nice. And that's where it all started. That's where it all started. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember having great experiences growing up uh, with my hairstylist. So I I don't know. I have really good experiences with them. Um, when did you begin painting? Was it, I mean... From as long as you yeah. can remember, because your mom was doing it? Or off and on, it, yeah, yeah, off and on from as, as young as I can remember. Mm -hmm. and my mom and dad, just like most parents, save their kids' art, you know. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as long as I can remember. But I started taking it seriously again. I don't know. I've been cutting hair for 11 years now, three years professionally, and about two years ago, the artistry of cutting hair kind of lost its you know, gusto in my mind mm -hmm. and hair really became more about like social interaction. And I realized that what I was providing was more of an experience and less of a service. The service is obviously important. You know, right. I want to mm -hmm. make sure that everyone's getting exactly what they want, um, exceeding their expectations when it comes to the service. But the conversation and who I am as a person, I think is really what makes the package worth the price. Right. Um, and so anyway, in whenever I was kind of thinking in that vein, that's whenever the creativity of it lost its edge a little bit in my mind, and so I picked up a paintbrush again and started painting. Awesome. Yeah. And, um, you know, that focus on your brand and men's mental health, why, why do you think that's important to focus on men's mental health? Well, Sorry. I mean, it's important. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. I, I mean... Uh, and it, it doesn't get spoken about uh, yeah. as much, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've fostered an environment, like I was, I kind of alluded to earlier, the the product that I bring to the table is more is less than is more than just a good haircut, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have a competitively um, excellent haircut, um, but what I really bring to the table is fostering an environment where people can feel heard, and mm -hmm. and they listen too. You know, it's like this two way street where we're sharing and caring and responding to each other's hurts and you know empathizing with each other's weaknesses and burdens and and so anyway, in that environment, it's not unique to my chair. It's very. Uh, uh, common among like hair styling as you alluded to earlier right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and so essentially the brand I want to build is more than just good haircuts you know I want to replicate myself in the fact that I'm doing more than just cutting hair I'm, you know yeah it's an experience yeah. as well and I mean the way you're describing it, it sounds even like therapy even <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. you're both like I, releasing your, your stresses and traumas, yeah. you know, I'm um, no licensed therapist or doctor or have any right. accolades to put behind my name, but I just care about people and hear, hear what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. would you say that your painting affects your hairstyling or, and, or yeah. vice versa? Yeah, absolutely. I cut hair and I cut hair and paint in a very similar way hmm. in that, um, there's like forms and like, uh, parameters, you know? But when it comes to like finalizing the details, I don't have, I don't cut hair in a way that's like, all right, I'm going to use this one and then this two and then this three. And then in this area, I'm going to use scissors. It's like, I'm going to make this outline and then whatever tool is closest to me, I just kind of grab that and then boom, 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 you know? And like, it's really hard for me to teach <laughs> yeah. because my style of cutting hair is very like artisan, you know? It's less of a formula. Interesting. And, and painting yeah. is very similar too. Like, uh, like the mo the painting that you referenced earlier, um, it has the black box it's surrounded by uh, gold leaf and you know, various other pen, magic marker, you know, liquid nail, all kinds of other mixed mixed media materials. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I started with a form and then literally left it there for a week, and then I would look I, I would look at it on the easel as I walked through my house until I had until I realized what's the next thing I want to add. Mm -hmm. Instead of like planning it out on an iPad and then painting it, or just you know, so you take your time. Yeah, with I the take painting. my time. Yeah, instead of just busting it out in an hour or something. Right. Mm -hmm. What are all those other services that you offer? 
No, like beards, eyebrows. Um, getting into skincare. I have a really awesome skincare line by a yeah. company called Arbonne. Mm. And uh, Derm Results is the line. They have a few different lines, but yeah, it's all organic, plant based. Shout out to my wife. She sells it. Sounds I use great. it, love it. All my clients are looking for something good. So, what would you say you find most satisfying about hairstyling? Um, well, me and you have a similar haircut. It's mm-hmm. kind of like a mohawk, but yeah. it's also kind of like a mullet. But it's also like a crop kind of in the front because we let it hang over our forehead, you know. But then it's mm-hmm. also like a taper on the sides. Like So there's a lot of different elements going on in your style and my style, which is funny. We have almost the same haircut right yeah, now. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> um, Great minds. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a trending for sure. Yeah. But uh, I love a haircut that is like it's so complex that a client can't ask for it. Mm-hmm. You know, they have to show you a photo. Yeah. Whereas like something is – uh, cookie cutter, no disrespect to anybody who does these styles. I do these styles too, but they're definitely not like something that I'm like want to advertise. Uh, it's just like a f- regular bald fade, you know, where it's like skin above the ear all the way around or like a white wall on the sides, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. It's like super cookie cutter, and every barber should know how to do those haircuts. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. those are money making haircuts, right? right? But the stuff sure. that I like to do and that I like to advertise and that I really want to hang my hat on is the stuff that's, like, super complex and fun. Stuff that, a, like, a typical barber would look at and say, what is, it? like, that's ugly, you know? You know what I mean? Confused. <laughs> I want to look at it. I want my client to be like, dude, I freaking love this. This is, like, super disheveled and funky. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like I did it at, my, at home by myself, but it's way better than that. Mm-hmm. And like, you truly can't get it anywhere else. Yeah. Right. Um, where do you see your brand expanding in the future? Oh, man. Um, Mm -hmm. My goal is to own a shop uh, for this brand that is much less of a 30-chair, 20-chair shop that's, like, everybody's doing as many cuts as they can and instead have, like, seven barbers max where we're charging a lot more, but we're giving you way more time, way more attention. All the barbers are making even more than they would if they were working at a chop shop like that. And have a space on top of that dedicated to, like, selling art, socializing, doing pop-up events for coffee tastings and whiskey tastings and maybe even, like, small sets, standing room only, acoustic concerts, things like that. That'd be awesome, yeah. Yeah, really bring – because what I've noticed – I'm going off on a tangent here, but (laughs) – You're good. Essentially – I mean, that's what this is for, right? Yeah, of course. Essentially, the concept of 101 Barber Company is really taking it back, like, old school. Like, barber shops used to be that third place, right? Starbucks coined this concept of having a third place, right? You got your workplace, you got your house, and then you got Starbucks, right? You go there not only just to get a coffee, but to use the free Wi-Fi, right? You you post up, Mm -hmm. and you can socialize there, right? Right. That's essentially what barbershops used to be before all that stuff happened. Men would go, they'd read the newspaper, they'd socialize, they'd, you know, they'd catch up on what's the local buzz, and they would get a haircut and say, what's up, and peace, and they would leave, right? Mm -hmm. Um... In modern culture, everybody's moving so fast, right? They they want an appointment so they can get in and they can get out, right? right? But if I if I if I really want to take it back old school, make barbering what it used to be, I think I have to be super um, intentional about the space in that I, there needs to be a space solely dedicated to the social aspect, right. right? Instead of just saying, "Hey, you guys can stay around if you want," I want to actually have a space that's like, "Oh no, literally, you can go vibe over there." Use the free Wi-Fi, post up at the chair, you know, look at some art, right? Invite your friend. Even if they're not getting a haircut, you just hang out, you know? Right. Oh, I love that. Like, I, I don't think I've seen min- much of that here in the area, so it'd yeah. be, I think you'd be, like, the first to do it. Yeah, it's definitely a niche that I want to capture. And Awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're listening and you're interested in, in helping Luke build his brand, you know, contact uh, cutsbyluknoles.com, and you can find all the information there. Wow, look, well, sounds exciting. Uh, yeah. I, I'm very excited for your future. I'm, I'm very excited to see where this brand goes. And thank you for stopping by and talking to me a little bit about it. Yeah, I appreciate it, Hector. No problem. Anytime. All right, you guys, that is the end of our show. A big thank you to Dr. Diane Cahill Bedford and Luke Knowles for being a part of this project. And thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to tune in next week. I'm Hector Nino, and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu.
The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu.